that's that's good you chose AP Cam first. <laughs> um, I, I did a little test and was on on two different programs at the same time. Mm -hmm. As noticed. Yeah. There's two of me, and I, and I actually didn't see any differences between them, but there's a feature at the top where you can choose the quality, how much bandwidth you're using. Mm. And so I, when I showed up the bandwidth, that seemed to help out. But. Oh, that's good. Cool. You guys are amazing. I'm going to sign out. Uh, All right. I'm pretty much uh, really impressed. Nice job. Mm -hmm. You have hey. a great evening. Oh, thank you. You too. You too. Bye, Mr. Kimball. Bye. Bye. That's awesome. Mr. Warren, did you ever get to the picture he put up? I did. I did. I ended up. Oh, okay. Don't you? What you? Get out of it. Yeah. You know what? I ended up doing. <laughs> oh, uh, I figured that. Oh, you did. Okay. I didn't help. You I just clicked on a screen. Yeah. I clicked on the screen share stuff. I clicked on the drive app over in the corner. Oh, okay. That works too. Uh, I actually know okay. that picture and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, it's I have two and a half weeks till that test. We're, no, I have three weeks till that test. We're good. And it's acidification, so it's what we're doing here, right? No. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How we affect acidification. Environmental sciences use equations or values. It's more just like... Oh, really? Hey, we burn coal, which produces, which like lets off sulfur dioxide, which forms <laughs> acid in the atmosphere and rains down and contributes to acid acidif as ocean acidification. Plus, the abundance of CO two in the atmosphere, there is an ocean sea surface exchange where the CO two or the carbon that's stored in water, like ends up back in the atmosphere and somehow it converts to carbonic acid, and that's the part where I get really stuck. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the only reason I know that CO2 is soluble in water. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. I like it. Because the ocean holds most of, well, not most, but the ocean holds a lot of the world's CO2. And as the ocean warms up because of global warming, fun fact, it, the CO2 can escape more easily, which is a positive feedback loop, meaning that as the oceans warm up, more CO2 joins the atmosphere, which warms up the Earth more, which releases more CO2, and it just keeps going. Wow. You would think that maybe one day we're just going to boil the oceans away. Pretty much. Like Venus. No. <laughs> no? How's <laughs> Venus? I could see that happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think... This is really good that we're covering this right now. You guys will be very pleased. Yes. Um, I will look at one more question on the KB because I think there was one more. Um, oh, uh, okay. So, another hypothetical question in which <laughs> CO3 2 minus has a KB of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, not super important what what the KB is of this. What it then asks you is, okay, you have K2CO3. And so you're not starting with acetic acid. You are starting with CO3 2 minus. So you're going to treat this a bit as if it's its own entity. So, and because it's soluble, the, um, the K is an alkali metal. It's one of the very, very soluble alkali metals. You are going to consider it to, if you do a net ionic equation, it's a spectator ion. So you have CO3, 2 minus, combining with water in equilibrium. It's going to give you, first, it's going to give you HCO3 um, minus plus OH minus. And this is really, when it says KB like this for the CO3, two minus, you should probably think of it as like KB1. And then there's like a KB2, which is probably equal to something like five times 10 to the negative eighth or something like that. Because then what happens is then the HCO3 minus combines with water to form H2CO3 plus OH minus. So adding these H's on, let's say it's 
it's more and more difficult. Um, so what's happening is when you think about the KB, the KB is equal to um, the concentration of the HCO3 minus times the OH minus all over this concentration of the CO3 2 minus. And that's equal to 1.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. Or if I just write it out for emphasis, 0 0.00018. And remember that Kb is equal to products over reactants. So if I was going to rephrase this question, looking at this initial right here, just this initial one right here, based on the fact that it's a weak base, and we have this KB, and we know what K stands for, which of those four, I say four, let's ignore water because it's really not in there, which of those three is in greatest concentration? CO3 two minus. And why is that? Because the KB is less than one. Yes. Okay. So, um, so that is what the question is. The multiple choice answers are CO3 two minus, HCO3 minus, OH minus, and it also gave, because it was so fun, H3O plus as a possibility as well. And so your answer should have been CO3 two minus. I think that may be one of the ones that actually got right. <laughs> I can't even remember this question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was a. Uh, it was that definitely there were a lot of those K questions. K A K B P K A P K B, um, and that was just when you said there was a three in a row or four in a row. That was the last one in a row for that. So, um, trying to to think through that and think about what the K means when it has such a low. But what, you know, 0 0.00018, you know, that means that your products are very small compared to your reactant. So you're looking at that and finding your reactant, and that's the one that's in the, the highest concentration. So um, I don't know if that's going to particularly help you on the free response, but it could definitely help you on the, on the actual chem test itself on Monday. So that's good fun. Um, there were several questions about um, electrochem. How did you guys feel about those questions? I remember there was one that I think I struggled with. I don't remember which it was. Okay. Um, let me see if I can pull that up in just a second. Uh, let's see. So... Oh, by the way, how about the PES question at the very beginning? I understood that because of your review. Okay. Yeah, Good, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I had a random one. It was on the back page, I think. Oh. It was which one would take the most energy? Which process requires the greatest amount of energy per mole of H2O? That one. Okay. Um, I wonder if that was... Was that attached to any other questions? No, no. all by itself. Oh, all by itself. You are absolutely right. Okay. So, amount of energy per mole of H2O. So, energy per mole for H2O. And so your options are... Um, your options are breaking... Breaking the OH bond. Okay. And then another one is evaporation. And another one is subliming. And what is sublimation? Solid to a gas. Yes. Solid straight to a gas. And evaporation is liquid to gas. And finally melting. Oh, that's interesting which, of course, is a, um, oh, solid to a liquid, right? Um, now, if I was just going to do test-taking strategies, I would have eliminated the first one because these three are all phase changes. But I would say this. What is it easier to do? Um, 
is it easier to, uh, let's say, how much, okay, how about this? How much energy does it take to melt sugar versus actually burning sugar? Which takes more energy? Burning. Burning. When you're burning sugar, you're actually breaking those carbon, hydrogen, oxygen bonds in sugar. Or, wait, yeah, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen bonds in sugar. So to actually break a covalent bond like that, is difficult to do like it requires a lot of energy but if i just want i mean you just put a puddle of water out there and it'll evaporate to a gas or melt an ice cube sublimation would take more energy than either melting or evaporation so if i mean and really if you want to put them in order so the melting does not take very much energy compared to evaporation which is less than sublimation which is much less than breaking that OH bond. Oh, okay. See, I wasn't sure what they meant by breaking OH bond, whether they were talking within a molecule or between yes. molecules. No, no, no. They're just talking about, they're bre are you, you're breaking that bond right there. Okay, that's, see, that's the reason. I thought it was between molecules, so I chose sublimation. Oh, see, when he, um, he drew it out, kind of, it actually said like this. He it actually looked like this. O H. Mm -hmm. If if you were looking at it from a perspective of um, from if you're looking at a perspective of the of the H two like from like this right here. What would have happened is it, it would have been like an O, and they would like they would have represented with the the dashes like that. Okay. Does okay. that? Say again. Oh, I said okay. Okay, so I can I can see why that was confusing. That's so a bummer. like a clarification: Are intermolecular forces stronger or, or intramolecular? Forces? So the intra. This is a good question. Intra is stronger than inter. Oh, okay. And a great way to look at this is which is stronger diamond or salt like which is it which which is it easier to melt or which is it easier to to break the bonds between a, inside of a diamond or inside of a salt inside of salt inside of salt so the diamond is much greater and that's just one gigantic covalent bond right it's a macromolecule and they're all intramolecular Okay, whereas the salt, it's all intermolecular forces. Ionic, and that's what you're taught. Ionic is stronger than covalent is stronger than, but it, that's not entirely true because it's it's the intra right there. That that's why the covalent is so much stronger. Like to actually break the bond between them is very difficult. Now, granted, burning salt is a lot. It takes a lot more energy. Like to burn salt would take a lot more energy than burning sugar, which again, that's that's covalent. So ionic is stronger than covalent. But when you're talking about intermolecular forces like this, just between these are phase changes. These aren't even chemical changes. These are phase changes. And phase changes are much, much less energy is required than a chemical change. And that could make, I don't know, maybe that might be another way to look at that. So covalent molecules, they have really strong forces within them, but then weaker, like, intermolecular forces, because that's just based on polarity and then, like, London dispersion forces. Right. Yes, okay. London dispersion force. That's a good one. London dispersion forces being the weakest of those intermolecular forces. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, oh, I was still, I was going to look for a electrochem example. Oh, there was one about, um, oh, 
goodness. I think it was magnesium. A magnesium wire being dripped or dipped into a solution oh, with. I remember the one about um, aluminum oxide. Or, yeah, aluminum to oxide. They're saying, like, how many moles of. Oh, really? Oh, that was weird. Electrons would create, like, so many moles of aluminum or okay. something like that. Looking through this, I found I found the one you're referencing, Sneha. The one you're referencing, um, Caitlin, could it have been a um, a zinc strip and a copper strip? No? Possibly. I, I don't remember. I think it mentioned a wire. Or, a wire, okay. I think it was towards the end. All right. I, it was a longer one. Like, it had written out explanation. It did, okay. Well, let me do let me do Sneha's and then I'll go back and see if I can find yours. All right. So let's see. So we have um, it's so you have you have electrolysis and aluminum is extracted from the ore and there's a two Al two O three goes to four Al plus three O two. And um, how many moles of aluminum are produced from the passage of 1.50 moles of electrons? Oh, how funny is that? 50 moles. I feel like we just did this, and but not this way of doing it, unfortunately. Okay, so if you have... Um, just double check on this. Okay, so 1.5 moles of electrons, and for every, let me take a look. 1.5 moles of electrons. Um, okay. For every three moles of electrons, you get one mole of aluminum. I feel like there's more to this than what I'm about to do. Yeah, that's I tried that, but that didn't feel right because some of the electrons have to go to the oxygen. They can't all go to the aluminum. Um, no, but the problem is they can because you're if if you're doing this electrolysis and you're running the current. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if you stopped right here, you would actually get the right answer. Really? Yeah, but I but I it doesn't feel right. So let's say that so for in this particular situation. If you're getting the aluminum, see, because this this is real. Like that's a real equation. This really happens. They do this. Aluminum oxide is a rock. It's a rock that they heat up. They make it really hot, and they get the aluminum, and it becomes like a sludge at the bottom. It's like a giant tub. And so they put the rock, and they what. They, they put the rocks all in here, whatever. And then all across the bottom, this sludge builds up that's the aluminum. And they end up kind of, they, they get in, and I say a sludge, but it, what ends up happening is they have these gigantic long things of, they're like slabs of aluminum that come out of this. So this is a real thing. This is not like just made up just for this just for this problem. So but so that's why he put the equation in there, because it's real. What I would say, though, is that in looking at this, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't, 1.5 moles. I'm just trying to think about, like, if you plug this in, I don't know if you need to do more. Like, the aluminum oxide runs through, and for every, yeah, I got that far and then thought yeah. that that 
could possibly be right. <laughs> right. Like it's 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 it it feels like it's coincidentally correct. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the other thing is sometimes they give you extra information to distract you. I think I ended up writing out half reactions, half reactions somehow. Really? And then it still ended up being that same ratio. Yeah. I would believe that. I mean, if if we did the half... Well, half reactions could work. Yeah. The aluminum oxide is... It's technically ionic. I don't know if... And you would have to separate it out, actually. You would have to do that. You Because you would have this Al3+. Plus. Yeah. I think I separated it. And then you would have the, yeah, see, you would have, and the O is a two minus. The problem being is they both, oh no. No, if you, no that's right, O two minus goes to O two. You'd have to put a two over here and you would have to add Oh, you wouldn't do that. You would do a, um, you'd probably add a water, probably cheating. Four electrons over here. This can't be right. Uh, three times four. And that would cancel these out. And you would get something kind of the same, but um, I still feel like you're still doing, I mean, even if you try to say, oh, well, for, no, see, I, I think that's it. I really do think that's it. I think that that was an overly complex looking problem. Because it's like a plating problem to a certain degree. Like you have the aluminum oxide and you, it separates out into an ionic thing and then you, you plate the aluminum. I would say this, that the ratio, again, it could be coincidental, but the ratio is a two to four. So it's like a half situation, but not that you would see. I just don't see it. I see this is I see this being it because usually what we do is it's like however many electrons are used. That's how many moles of aluminum. So every for every three moles of electron, you get one mole of the actual aluminum, and then you would have to go from there. But he's just asking there. He's just asking specifically about moles of aluminum. And and that was it. I mean, that's the answer. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, it feels too easy. I, I will, especially after some of those questions, it feels way too easy. But I, I can't see how to, how to, I guess, make that more complex or, or get to an answer um, that feels more right. Most unfortunate. Uh, let me see if I can find the wire one. Oh, how about that? Let me just read this. So a chemical cell is constructed using the reaction. You have the zinc plus copper ions yields zinc ions plus copper solid. A zinc strip is immersed in zinc nitrate, is connected to a copper strip immersed in one molar copper nitrate with a wire and the two solutions are connected via a salt bridge. That's not the one I was thinking of. It's not? Okay. I will keep looking. It was something about, like, I, I honestly don't remember. It was a, um, it had to do with if it was more easily reduced or not because, like, a wire was dipped into a certain substance I think it was magnesium dipped into lead. Okay. Like a lead solution, and then it ended up with a black residue on the wire. I don't remember this problem at all. I don't either. It's it sounds. <laughs> it could have been on the practice one. It definitely sounds like an AP style question, but I definitely do not remember I that one. Point, I might be going insane. <laughs> It's getting all mixed up in your head. I hope not. Uh, um, let me see on the practice exam real quick. 
It would be. It would. Have, it would have been a multiple choice. So. Or it might have been on the practice test that we're taking in class. To oh. Oh. Yeah, I, think I it could, might have been. I could see that one happening. Um. Okay. Never mind. Well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt to go over that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is not on the practice test I sent home. So let me. Um, Okay, I can I can um, I can probably open it up really quick. It's, it's all running together. It is it is totally running together. <laughs> all right. We're all going slowly insane. <laughs> <laughs> CSTs and APs, and while I'm doing this, I'm trying. My friends are trying to plan prom at Whitney, and I'm just like, I don't care. Tell me where I need to be and when. Yeah. Like, oh my god. That would That's do it. Well. Okay. I mean, I'll with them, not with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. Sometimes it's just like, can I just hide in my room for forever? <laughs> Yeah. I found it. I found it. Let me share it. I'm not completely crazy. You are not completely crazy. Uh, it was a debatable there for a little bit. No, it wasn't. Not yeah. ever. Okay. When a magnesium wire is dipped into a solution of lead to nitrate, a black deposit forms on the wire. Which of the following can be concluded with this observation? So, um, if you get black, it's usually either lead or sulfur. And so, um, so that means lead is, and there's no, there's no, um, it's not like you're having to force electrolysis through this. So the standard reduction potential E naught for lead equals is greater than that for magnesium. So if lead is being reduced, it is gaining electrons and it is forming a solid. So I would say that, I haven't looked at the answers. I would say that A has the, a potential to be the correct answer because if you're getting the black deposit on there, then it, the lead must be becoming solid, coming out of solution and going in, and so which means it's being reduced, which means that it's higher on the standard reduction potential table. Um, B, magnesium as a solid is a less easily oxidized than lead Um, no, because if lead is higher, then magnesium has to be lower, which would mean that it could be oxidized, I guess. An external source of potential must have been supplied. Um, I guess that's a possibility. If, if lead, if magnesium was higher than lead, then an external source would have had to have been provided. The magnesium wire will be the cathode of a magnesium lead cell. So cathode is where reduction happens. So that seems possible as well. This is interesting. And lead as a solid can spontaneously displace magnesium 2 plus from solution. Um, If that was happening, then it would also be going in reverse. So let's take a look. So 54 was A, which is the one that I thought it was going to be. Go too high. So the standard reduction potential E not for lead. So looking at this, magnesium is less easily oxidized. And I said, no, that one can't be right. It would have to be more easily oxidized. This one, C, an external source of potential must have been supplied. Like, you would have had to have, you would, you don't have the standard reduction potential table on the test, so you don't know for sure. So that's like a, a wild hair of an idea, and so it's just too crazy. D, the magnesium wire will be the cathode of a magnesium lead cell. So on that one, oh, here's the problem. Well, 
if you just drop the wire in there and it's just happening, the magnesium has to have, like to, if you have a cell, you have to have a circuit almost. And so the magnesium has to come off the wire, right? And so if it was a, if, if you had a cell, the magnesium wire would actually end up being the anode because, because that's where oxidation occurs. Does that make sense? That's why D can't be the right answer. You would have had to have a, probably like a lead wire where more lead was being plated in order to have it be the cathode. This is like, it's happening, reduction is happening there, but it's not a cell. It's not in, in the, the terms that we're familiar with vol voltaic or electrolytic cells. It's not that happening. It's just a reaction. It's just a, there's just some electrochemistry happening, but it's, it's not, because if, if you have reduction happening, the magnesium, let's say you'd have to have oxidation, the other side of it, and so, Magnesium is going to have to be coming off while lead is going on. And a solid is not going to spontaneously displace a, an ion. You can have an ion spontaneously displacing a solid. You could have the reverse of that, Pb2 plus spontaneously displacing Mg solid, because that's, that's possibly what could happen, but not the reverse. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can see why that would be confusing. But definitely, I think I, I would lean towards A because it's the most familiar statement to what we've talked about in class and how electrochemical cells are supposed to work. What test was this on? This is the extra credit test that you're doing in class. Okay. Okay. All right. We are just cruising. Um, what else would you possibly like to discuss? Well, let's do this really quick. Um, uh, I have a I have a test that I would like us to look at. Okay, I'm gonna share it. It's that, it's from the Crash Course book. All right, so here's the, like if we start, here's some multiple choice. I wonder if I could jump to the free response, that would be a lot more fun, huh? Section two, let's do that. Okay. Oh, how ironic. <laughs> the so can you guys see it? Okay, does it need to be bigger? We can see like the answer choices. Sorry, that's better. Okay. So yeah. the directions up there are just saying how much time you have and using a calculator. Okay. All right. The value for the ionization constant Ka for hypochlorous acid HOCl is three point two times ten to the negative eight. So A part, calculate the pH of a 0 0.030 molar solution of HOCl. So that one is actually pretty easy. Do you guys have any ideas? It would be x squared over 0 0.03 equals to the Ka. Yes, that's exactly right. And then once you solve for x, then you just plug it into your negative log and you get the pH. Um, Calculate the percent dissociation of the solution. How would you possibly do that one? Would you take the molarity of the H plus mm -hmm. over 
similarity of the acid and then just yes. as a percentage? That's exactly right. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> see. Count it down your time remaining. Count yeah, it is. <laughs> Calculate the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution prepared by mixing equal volumes of the weak acid with its conjugate base. Oh, interesting. Oh, but the, the, the molarities are different. Can you do um, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation? You I, yeah, you could because, because you could do the pH equals pKa. You have the Ka, you could get the pKa from that. Okay. And then you would, um, pH is equal to that. And so then you could do the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. It would give you the pH. And then you would just do 10 to the negative of whatever the pH is. Caitlin Solomon, are you following this? You're quiet. Yeah. Okay. So C seems pretty straightforward. This is, I thought this would be a, a more difficult test, but boy, this would sure be nice if, if the actual exam is like this. <laughs> Yeah. You can help, right? Cross fingers. Yes, yes. And toes. Yeah. <laughs> um, D, calculate the pH at which 50 milliliters of 0 0.030 molar HSCL solution is at the equivalence point after adding 50 milliliters of a standard sodium hydroxide solution. Okay. Interesting. Which 50 milliliters of the 0 0.030. Could you do the Henderson Hasselbalch adding, uh, like if you found the moles of the NaOH mm -hmm. and then added that to the base content, or found the molarity and then added that to the. Mm -hmm. um, like if you went to. The base and subtract it from the acid and then. Is the Henderson Hasselbalch equation again? I think you could. Like, if, wait, you're talking about okay. So if you had the, if you find the number of moles of this, is that what you're talking about? So you have the moles of that equals the moles of whatever this is. So you'd have to have you'd figure out the molarity because the moles would have to equal the moles, right? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. And then once you have because it's at the equivalence point, which means your moles of acid equals moles of base. So you have your moles of acid, you get your, and you figure out the molarity of the solution in the 50 milliliters, but you, you have the moles. And then once you get the moles... You can solve for the molarity and then just plug it right. into Right. The... And the new, because you need the molarity of the new solution, which is now divided by 100 milliliters. Which, gosh darn it, wouldn't that be the, wouldn't the pH just be equal to the pKa again? No, that can't be right, because that's, um, no, 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 that's not right. So if you do the pH, you get all, okay, so at the equivalence point, okay, here's the thing, let's see. Once you get, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> once you, once you have stripped all of this to just OCL. You figure out how many moles of OCL minus you have. Let me jump to this. Let me then go. Do you add that to the moles of OH? I I think actually what you would end up doing is remember the equivalence point is that they are they are equally the moles of acid equal moles of base. So what's what's happened is that you had. 50 milliliters of 0 0.030, wait, I'm, I can't see my actual test anymore. Yeah, okay. Molar HOCl. And so if you added some base, you would react with all of this, however much that is. So 0 0.03 times 0 0.05 is 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, 5, I believe, moles. And you divide that by 0 0.1, 
because that's the number of liters. So you'd end up with 0 0.0015, so which is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the negative third. Now, the thing is, is that HOCl plus, and if these were in equal volumes, you would end up with the NaOCl plus OH minus. So the Na's go away. Wait, did I do that right? Oh, water, not plus water. And the Na's go away. And this, it's been all stripped off. So there's no more of the H of the HOCl. It's all gone. And the NaOH is all gone. Does that make sense? So what you're left with is OCl minus, which is the conjugate base to this weak acid which means it's not going to stay there. So you're going to have, okay, so you have a Ka that's equal to 3.2 times 10 to the negative eighth. Um, and what you could do is you could figure out the Kb because Ka times Kb and oh it says to oh by the way it says to assume that in the directions it says to assume all standard conditions unless otherwise stated and it doesn't say that the temperature is any different so we can assume that they're both equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 14th Ka times Kb so we divide that by 3.2 times 10 to the negative eighth. Um, and I'm, I'm going a little bit deep here, but I think that, because free response questions do that. They get more difficult as you progress down. So one exponent negative 14 divided by 0.2 exponent negative eighth. So you end up with a, you end up with a Ka, oh no, I'm sorry, Kb, which is equal to 3.125 times 10 to the negative seventh. And so once you've done this, you, um, you can do the ice table. And so then you end up with this, you know, 3.125 times 10 to the negative eighth is equal to x squared over the concentration which we just said was 1.5 times 10 to the negative third molarity. So you solve for x, and that gives you your OH minus. You could then solve for pOH, and then 14 minus pOH equals pH. So that question, A, B, and C were relatively easy, and D suddenly was super convoluted. Did you guys follow what I did? Okay. Not so much? Are you guys still there? Did you guys pass out? Yeah, I'm still right there. Okay. I'm really honest that my brain has kind of checked out, so it probably made sense. I just... <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the main thing there is that the whole point was that they said equivalence point. And so let's just talk about that briefly for a moment. Let's go back to talking about equivalence point. Um, equivalence, you know, because we did discuss equivalence point versus end point, because I think that people still struggle with that. Equivalence point. So that means that moles of acid equals moles of base. And whenever you have a weak, let's say it's a weak acid plus a strong base, that means that it's all converted to the conjugate base. It all goes over here. So there's no more of the molecular form of the weak acid. And if it's at the equivalence point, there's also no more strong base because it was all used up to convert that weak acid to the conjugate base. And so 
when when we have the picture, you know, this is the whole thing about the weak acids, you know, the, here's the pH over here and here's the volume as it's added, that it starts off and it goes in this buff region and then suddenly that's why it spikes up here. And this is why this equivalence point, like let's say here's seven and the equivalence point is up here, it's higher than seven because once all of that weak, all the molecular weak acid has been used up, then suddenly it spikes up and you get to the equivalence point here. There's no strong base happening on it, but the conjugate base, it's weak. So it, it attracts an H and produces OH minus, which is what I was drawing on this side right here. This OCl minus, which is the conjugate base, reacts with water to produce OH minus. So it's doing that automatically. And so that's what now you end up, that's why when you are at an equivalence point, you don't have, you have no excess strong base. The strong base is not contributing to the pH at all. It's all the conjugate base. Oops. It's all the conjugate base that's contributing to the pH, which is why that pH is higher than seven. So that, does that make a little bit, a little bit of sense there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was actually confused about this before, so now it makes more sense. Oh, okay, good. Good. So, anyways, if you if you ended up taking that problem to its finish, you would have ended up with a pH that was higher than seven. Alright. And let's just look at the let's just end looking at the last um, part of that problem, and then we can just be done for tonight. Good plan. Okay. No, what? Oh, well, I'm glad. I get, there's definitely, a, at some point, you kind of get to overload. Um, what needs to be added to the solution in part C to create a solution of maximum buffering ability? So, in part C to create a solution of maximum buffering ability. So, you have HOCl, calculate the hydrogen ion concentration solution by mixing equal volumes of a 0.03 to a 0 0.020 molar solution of sodium hypochlorite. Well, that is a weak acid and its conjugate base, which is a buffer. But if you did this, oh, okay. Well, before I give you guys the answer, do you guys have a guess on what it might be? Is this the thing that we talked about earlier? A little bit. Yeah, actually, remember we did those two ice tables. We had two problems where it would, you know, you, you've got um, a situation where you have um, a situation where you have, you added a strong base to a weak acid to get the buffer. So in this particular situation, they've got some, they mixed solutions of the weak acid and they mixed it with us with a with a conjugate base basically and while that's a good way of doing it it's not always the most effective and, and they have equal volumes of two different molarities and so to be to 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 have the maximum buffering ability they need to be right in the middle of that buffer region so they have, if they have equal volumes, they end up having more HOCl than they do NaOCl. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Because this is 0 0.02. Yeah. Okay, so what you need to do, and I'm just going to share it really quick. Um, would you add NaOH again? Yes. Yes, you would. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, what, um, what they have is, I'm going to make it red, they have more weak acid than they do conjugate base. And so they're going to be more in this, oops, they're going to be more in this region. But the maximum buffering ability means that it can go either way, either way and still be safe. So you want to be right in the middle of that zone. So you need to add enough NaOH that it converts the HOCl to NaOCl. So you're, like you said, you're going to have to add a little bit of NaOH. And so I don't know if that question is actually asking you for the amount of NaOH that needs to be added, because here's the funny thing. That question hints at the very thing that AP has excluded, which is how much base 
needs to be added to a buffer to change the pH. So I'm going to assume that E is a situation where um, E is a situation where you just um, say, oh, you have to add base. And of course, and that goes against what I was saying earlier, how they get harder going down. Every now and then, it's not true. And maybe this is one of the situations. There is the possibility that you actually have to calculate how many moles of NaOH have to be added. Um, but, and, and the difference in here, this is what I would say, you have 0 0.03, let's say you have 0 0.03, moles of the HOCl and you have 0 0.02 moles of the NaOCl and if you want to have exactly the same amount of both what do you guys think you should should add? Would you dilute the HOCl? No, you add 0 0.01 no. moles of NaOH. Well, close, close, close. What you need to do is 0 0.03 minus 0 0.02 gives us 0 0.01, and you have to divide it by 2. So you need to add 0 0.005 moles of NaOH so that you would subtract 0 0.005 moles from this, and you would add 0 0.005 moles to that. And then you would end up with both being 0 0.025. Oh, Gosh, I added an extra zero in there. You would end up with 0 0.025 moles of that, and you'd end up with 0 0.025 moles of that. So basically, that's what you would need to add. You know, I admit I'm feeling exhausted too. That was a huge brain drain. And I didn't even take three tests today. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's I heard that's like that. Yeah. Good. Are there going to be any more Google Hangouts before the Monday? Well, I had not anticipated on doing that uh, because I was trying to get them all in really kind of before the final exam was finished. And then I, I hate to take away your weekend. Um, because I don't know, I mean, I, you guys have a lot to study for and I, tr I usually try not to have them right the weekend right before. So people don't feel like they're like over committing to my class. <laughs> um, let me take a look at my schedule. Yeah, I'm going to try and avoid studying Sunday. Are you? Okay. I, I, I don't think like if I don't know it by Sunday, then there's no, I'm not going to know it by Monday. Right. Well, I can't do it Friday. Class. Yeah, I can't do it. Friday studying anymore past this. Like I might study a little bit more too. I think I'm just gonna go over polyatomic ions and then that's it. Oh just some EPR theory. Yeah. Yeah you guys have done a lot. I have stuff going on all Saturday and I don't want to study Sunday so Yeah. I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. I think I think the only thing I mean you guys can do whatever you want to. I think that those those quick reviews or those those exam reviews, those thir thirty two page like a like a little summary of every topic, those have some possibility as just a just to remind you of stuff. But other than that, I gotcha. We can still come in tomorrow morning to do the extra credit, right? You can do that both tomorrow morning and Friday morning. Okay. So yeah, that would be great. Well, all right, you guys. Try to get some sleep tonight and okay. decompress a little bit. Thank you so much for doing these. Yeah, they're so helpful. Oh, I, it was my pleasure. I, I really, I have to be honest with you. I, I enjoy these a lot. I come out of these and tell my wife how much fun I have doing them. So, uh, it's, it's good for me too. I, I'm glad to do them, and I'm, I hope to do. I, I don't know how many we'll do for the rest of the year since we don't really have much to do. One. Just have a fun one. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> we could all go to random locations. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, I, I, I'm glad. And this is good to test out for this year. I think that um, I really want to see if I can do that for general chemistry, but I don't know how that would work with that, that many students. I don't know how many like would want to get on or I don't know. Yeah, I just like it because it's like having an extra couple hours of class time that we don't always get in class. This is true. This is very true. Well, and, you know, I was talking with Spears, and he was talking about 
if it were like office hours, you could be like, on Tuesdays, I'm going to be on from 8 to 9. Whoever wants to drop in can. So that has some potential too, maybe in the future. Yeah. Well, all right. You guys go. I'm going to go too. Um, thanks for coming. Good night, everyone. Uh, Good night. Good night. Good night.